can do the light this time. Yeah. statement in English, and then my colleague, national spokesperson, John Pinson, will give us a summary pretty much on the um, tree. Um, would you take it without <laughs> All right. All right. So, yeah, let's start. All right. Ladies and gentlemen of the media, I'd like to, on behalf of the Economic Fighters League, welcome you all to our whole sheet office for this very important press conference. We are gathered here today to officially register our displeasure at the attempt by the government to suffocate the people of Ghana by increasing the hardship that we are already facing. We are not here to dabble in the usual economic jibi jabba that is characteristic of the NDC and the MPP, political ostriches, but to cut through the noise and present in an uncensored manner the true reality of the economic and livelihood issues of Ghanaians. Last week, the Minister of Finance presented the budget for the year 2022. In that budget, included several objectionable policy intentions and measures, making it imperative for us to sharply respond to those. It is clear from the voices on the streets and the markets that the 2022 budget has come to compound the existing hardship inherent in the system. The government frequently uses COVID as an excuse for the hardship, economic hardship in the country forgetting that the people of Ghana were the ones who were hit the most by the pandemic, and continues to make life difficult, especially for the poor and vulnerable. And in Ghana today, only a few in the establishment are not vulnerable. Let's take the issues of concern one after the other. First would be taxes. Perhaps the most obnoxious policies in the 2022 budget is the increment in tax fees and charges and the introduction of new taxes, or taxes, thank you, pardon. I'm sure you've heard about the following taxes. Now, introduction of these new taxes and the increment in existing fees and charges clearly demonstrates the lack of sensitivity and of the establishment to the plight of the Ghanaian people in their struggle for de living, decent living standards and livelihoods. For instance, take the electronic tax, which is another economic shackle that has been slapped on mobile money transactions, bank transfers, and all the electronic money transactions. We must not let it be lost on us that the full implication of this tax on the day-to-day -day livelihoods of the people of Ghana is going to make it very difficult for the majority of the people. Mobile money has become the prevalent means by which people in the lowest classes of society transfer money from family and friends and business partners. Already the telecommunications companies place outrageous charges on people's transactions. When sending, money, when sending money on most telcos networks, one has to pay charges, and when receiving, the additional charges. This amounts to double charges on the same transaction. And this is something we have talked about and continue to oppose. The government could have put their levies 
on the charges already paid for mobile money transactions by the telecoms companies and ensure that they do not pass such levies to the consumer. Rather, the government has, has opted to increase the burden by slapping additional costs on the people for choosing to use mobile money as a medium of transaction. This is regressive and criminally insensitive. Pure water sellers who transfer 300 Ghana CDs to their suppliers after a day's sales will pay 5 CDs 25 pesos from their daily commissions. Pregnant women who transfer 120 Ghana CDs to a clinic in the village are now being asked to pay for seeking health care and safe delivery at the hospitals. Teachers and nurses, when they receive their salaries, would have to pay chunks of it to the government just for transferring a sa their salaries or part of the salary that's already been taxed by some 17.5%. A NAPO employee who takes his or his salary of nearly 700 CDs gets taxed 3 CDs 50 pesos for transferring 300 CDs out of their meager 700 CDs to his mother or, or father in the village. It must be placed on the record that in this country we are not guaranteed the standard of living. It must, I beg your pardon, I say that again. It must be placed on the record that in this country we are not guaranteed the standard of living. New research by the Institute for Statistical, Social and Economic Research of the University of Ghana has revealed that there are some 3 million people who cannot afford 3 CDs 30 pesos worth of food a day. I take that part again, just for clarity's sake. New research by the Institute for Statistical, Social and Economic Research of the University of Ghana has revealed that there are some 3 million people who cannot afford 3 CDs 30 pesos worth of food a day. There's a further 2 million who cannot afford 2 CDs 20 pesos worth of food a day. These statistics are also in the Ghana Living Standards Survey. In the Ghana Living Standards Survey, survey it was revealed that 9.2 million Ghanaians cannot afford 5 CDs a day. Now, all of this is coming on the back of consistent increases in fuel prices, which have affected the price of everything on the market. Fuel prices have risen at least 16 times in 2021, and the year has not even ended. As a result, food prices have skyrocketed, the regular ball of KK has shrunk in size, and this price of one Ghana CD has increased to about three CDs, which is between 100 and 200 percent increase. So kinky with pepper and fish has become kinky and pepper so Prices of staple foods such as maize, beans, cassava, yams, tomatoes and onions are fast becoming unaffordable for the majority of the people. The system is increasingly becoming too hot for Ghanaians. And I must add the ordinary Ghanaian. And this is not the time to be increasing taxes and introducing new taxes. A responsible state at this time, we'll be introducing measures to reduce the hardships on Ghanaians. In some cases, governments have initiated social intervention policies to enable their people to withstand the shocks of the pandemic. In our case, here in Ghana, the little we have left to survive on is now being taken from us. This cannot be the nation Ghana that once was the gateway to Africa, the beacon of hope that lit the path to liberation a shining example for the entire continent. This obviously can be that other. There are those who have said that the introduction of taxes is due to the shortfalls in revenue and that government needs to raise revenue to embark on governmental issues. There are many fundamental problems with this position. First of all, the monies that have been collected over the years through both domestic and foreign sources have not been used for productive development. They have been expended on frivolous things and stolen, and the key word to note here is stolen. Stolen by the ruling classes of both the MPP and the NBC without any form of accountability. How do you justify the introduction of new taxes without accounting for the ones you're already collecting? Development is not left to chance. It is a deliberate, scientifically verified process of applying mental capabilities to resources. The engine for growth in any economy is production, and production is dependent on the availability of raw materials in substantial quantities. This is the foundation on which industries are built. The wealth chocolate industry is valued at 100 billion US dollars. 
Ghana and her neighbor to the west, that is Cote d'Ivoire. By the way, we share a border, which is an imaginary line found on, only on paper, which was drawn at the Berlin Conference of 1844-1855. 1885, sorry. Which sets the ground rules for the colonization of Africa by European powers. And African natural resources were essentially stolen as we struggle, I mean, for the betterment of European industrial economies. This impact is still felt in Africa today as we struggle to develop. Now, I'm still, I'm still talking about Côte d'Ivoire. So Ghana and Côte d'Ivoire together supply 65% of the total global production of cocoa. But our farmers earn less than 6% of that chocolate industry total revenue. Secondly, there are many sources of revenue that have not been explored. We have consistently talked about all these viable sources of revenue, but successive governments have ignored them. We have, why have they ignored them, you ask? Because they benefit from the status quo, from the continuous exploitation and suffering of the Ghanaian people. Both MPP and NDC, both MPP and NDC political elite class benefit from the rot and they conveniently choose ways and means by which they can maintain and sustain these oppressive schemes so that they can perpetrate themselves in power and continue to steal both in, power, in government and in opposition. And what are these alternative sources, you might ask? One, cut down on, exca on excessive and discriminatory Article 71 payments. One of the biggest crimes perpetrated on the people by the 1992 Sakawa Constitution is the issue of excessive and discriminatory pay structure in favor of the so-called Article 71 office holders. Aside being criminally discriminatory, it has become a major drain on the public purse. We have an arrangement in the 1992 Constitution which provides for the payment of salaries to a section of public workers where, which in some cases are 100 times higher than the general public sector pay. This is because they are given the free will to determine their own salaries. The person sets up a commission which makes recommendations towards their emoluments. The executive approves the salaries for the parliament, and the parliament approves for the executive. So you have a typical case of you scratch my back, I scratch yours. But then the question in all of this is where are the rest of the public sector workers catered for? There's no mention of that anywhere in the constitution. Now, to give an illustration of this massive discrepancy and discrimination in this, consider the following. In 2016, the average salary of Article 71 of its holders was 18,211 Ghana cities, while the average salary on the single spine salary structure was 1,128. Let me repeat those figures. In 2016, the average salary of an Article 71 of its holder was 18,211 Ghana cities, while the average salary on the single spine salary structure was 1,128 Ghana cities. In other words, the average salary on the single spine salary structure was only 6% of the average salary of Article 71's public office holders. The highest paid public sector worker receives less than 30% of the monthly pay of an MP. In 2016, again, the monthly salary of a member of parliament was 19,000 136 Ghana cities. 19,136 Ghana cities. This increased to 28,017 pesos in 2020. The figures again, so you're looking at 19,136 Ghana cities as compared to 28,017 pesos in 2020. 270 cities in 2020. Now, if you have a copy which we'll share with you, you find a, um, a full table of all of these um, salaries that we were talking about, everything in table one. So we we'll share the copies after, right after. Aside these huge salaries, this crop of office holders, public office holders, are also recipients of massive allowances, in some cases for things that are already within their job descriptions. And three, they receive 5% consolidated salary for security. Four, Installation grants equivalent to two months' salary upon assumption of office. Five, they receive a 30% of their salary as incentive for committee chairman and 25% for committee members. They also receive free medical care for MPs. Their spouse, 
and four children under the age of, eight, of 18. They also receive resettlement grants at the end of the tenure of office, which is after every four years. Then at the end of every four years, they are given fat ex gratias. Now the formula used in calculating the ex gratia is usually the accumulation of four months salary for each year served. Thus, for a member of parliament who has worked from 2017 to 2020, we have to take monthly salary for each year and multiply that by four. And then add all the resultant figures. This comes up to a sum of about 390,768,000 The sum is 390,000 CDs, 768. I mean, 390,000, sorry, 768 Ghana We are also provided a table for these figures in the same document which we share with you. Now, we must emphasize that these figures are recommended figures from the Interior and Committee report. In most cases, the amounts recommended by the ex gratia committees are deemed too small and are substantially increased by the Article 71 Public Servants, and it seems no one ever gets to see the final approved figures from Parliament. Clearly, as the figure has shown, Article 71 offices are a huge drain on the public purse. And these figures are just for one person. If you're going to multiply this by 275 men, members of parliament, you can begin to appreciate the amount, the amount of money that goes on the national office just to pay salaries and benefits of a few people at the expense of the masses of the Ghanaian people. Now, it is a curse imposed upon us by this 1992 Kosakawa constitution. And like many provisions in that constitution, this article only benefits the upper ruling class in both the MPP and the NDC, which is the reason why both parties never want to touch the 1992 constitution. We have therefore demanded for the total abolishment of the 1992 constitution so that we can replace it with one that benefits all Ghanaians and not some Ghanaians. Two, stolen monies. Year in, year out, the Auditor General puts, on dam puts out damning statistics about the amount of money being stolen in the public sector. Irregularities in the form of blatant siphoning, siphoning of funds, non-payment of taxes, and appropriation of public access, assets for individual use, etc. Analysis from the, from the records of the Attorney General report revealed that over 12 billion, and with a B, 12 billion Ghana cities was lost to these irregularities in 2020 alone. A quantum leap of about, of about 135% from what was recorded in 2019. We acknowledge for the first time since 1992 that we got an Auditor General who was committed to sanitizing the public sector and ridding it of all corruption. Mr. Daniel Damilovo, sorry, his integrity was known to all and his diligent work proved purposeful to us it led to the recovery of millions of CDs to the public press through surcharges and disallowances. In spite of this stellar performance and integrity, what, we, what did we see happen to Mr. Damilovo? He was hounded and harassed day in, day out, and when he refused to be intimidated, they schemed and got him out on frivolous excuses, such as his age, <laughs> clearly showing that there's no interest in sealing the holes and mobilizing more revenue. And allow, allow me to play devil's advocate here. I mean, you have someone being ushered of public office for his age, that's about 60 something, and the person asking him to go on retirement is over 70 years. The irony is not lost on me. I mean, how can you have someone over 70 years asking someone below 70 years to go on retirement because he has passed the retirement age? That's quite ironic. Um, <laughs> anyway, the interest in raising charges and introducing new taxes is to further power more hardship, as we already said, on the people of Ghana and to cower them into submission. But we will not allow this to happen. Number three, frivolous expenditure. The continuous looting of the public purse through profligate waste and unnecessary expenditure drain our coffers. And the same people who supervise and engage in this corruption turn around to tell us there's no money. For instance, each minister and deputy minister is given a free V8 and a saloon car. The cost of the combined of these two vehicles can range between 85,000 US dollars, that's for a brand new land cruiser, and that will translate into about, that will convert into about 521,900 Ghana cities. 
and 120,000 US dollars, which will be converted to about some 736,800 Ghana cities for one V8. Now, on top of this, each minister is given free fuel and free freebies. So then again, it's not surprising that you have the constant increment of fuel prices because the very same people who are increasing fuel prices do not pay for fuel prices with their own monies. It's given to them for free. So they do not feel the, the heat and the brunt of these economic challenges that the ordinary Ghanaian like you and I is facing. Now, aside this, parliament, members of parliament are given car loans of up to 60%, of which falls on the state, and the state here will mean you and I, to repay plus interest on the loan while the cars become the personal properties of the MPs. If this is not robbery, then I really wish to see what other definition we can give to robbery. What's more, when our public officials are traveling across the country, this same V8s are lined up in very long convoys, displaying openness and lack of sensitivity, sensitivity to the people's monies. I mean, you can find one convoy running with no less than 30 V8s. And mind you, all of these will have to be filled with our taxpayers' money for whichever trip that they think they're going on. If there is no money, why is the president constantly disrespecting the people by renting very expensive and luxurious aircraft for international travels? People cannot afford pure water to drink, but he prefers to bath in the air while imposing more taxes on us. Meanwhile, the 1992 constitution, Sakawa constitution, exempts him from paying any taxes. If these frivolous expenditures are cut, one will see that there will be more than enough money in a national coffers to, su to support some of these so-called taxes or the governmental programs that they so dearly need their taxes to support. And it must be added at this point that if you have over 9 million Ghanaians who can't afford three Ghana cities, 9 million people who can afford five cities in Ghana, Take for instance that pure, essentially a pure water goes for 20 pesos. And if a normal average human being in this heat would have to drink, say, five sachets a day, that comes to one CD on just water. So now if you're struggling with five CDs, or let's even bring it down to the various minimum, which is three CDs, 30 pesos, and you have to spend one CD on just water, and a bottle of KK is not selling for one CD any longer, you have to spend about one CD, 50 pesos, or two pesos on just a bottle of KK. We're not even talking about fish. It means with three cities, with some more than three million Ghanaians will have to live on, those three million Ghana, those three million Ghanaians would have to live on just a bottle of kinky and probably just two or three sachets of water a day. Now this is the reality that makes many people are dealing with. So then we have we find it quite insulting when we find our so-called politicians coming out to tell us they need extra tax from us when they are getting all the benefits. Meanwhile, we don't see exactly what they're using their taxes, the taxes they're collecting, we don't see what they're using them for. But the ordinary man on the street would have to put up with all of this nonsense. I mean, we'd have to make great sacrifices just to make ends meet to go by a day. We'll come back to this. Now, when our public, our public officer, officials are traveling across the country, these V8s are lined up in long convoys displaying opulence and lack of sensitivity to the people's money. If there is no money, why is the president constantly disrespecting the people by renting very expensive and luxurious aircrafts for international travels? People can't afford pure water, as, as I've just said, to drink, but he prefers to bathe in the air while imposing more taxes on us to keep up with his opulent lifestyle. Meanwhile, the 1992 Sakawa Constitution exempts him and his other people, we call at 71 public holders, exempts them from paying taxes. Now, if these frivolous expenditure are cut, one could see that there will be more than enough money in the public office, again, to support some of these developmental projects. Now, four, tax concessions. Government since 1992, including both the MPP and the NDC, have consistently avoided discussion on the issue of tax concessions being doled out to multinational companies. These have become a major source of revenue leakage. In some cases, companies are given up to 10 years of operation without paying any taxes, and we call them tax holidays or tax breaks, running into billions of CDs. The World Bank Ghana Public Expenditure Review revealed that in one year alone, tax related for gone expenditure amounted to 5.2% of our GDP. 
calculate this by the GDP of Ghana in 2021, and you see the amount of billions that are being, are being freely dashed to foreign companies while we suffer in our own company, in our own country. This makes absolutely no sense. Therefore, this constitutes a huge revenue source that must be taken seriously. Tax concessions should be reviewed to increase revenue mobilization, I mean internal revenue mobilization. In the absence of this measure, imposition of taxes becomes a deliberate attempt to pile hardships on the people of Ghana. Number five, ownership and control of our resources. Closely related to the issue of tax concessions is the ownership and control of national or, nat or national natural resources. We have huge natural resources ranging from gold, bauxite, oil, manganese, amongst others. But these resources are largely owned and controlled by foreign multinational companies. Over 70%, and this is a very conservative figure, of the gold production and export is controlled by five companies, all foreign. The extractives module that is being run in this country is a total rip-off facilitated by our leaders, both in the MPP and the NBC, who are empowered by the so-called 1992 constitution, which is a sacred constitution, to give away our resources. Their only resort is royalties and corporate taxes to raise revenue. However, data shows undisputedly that equity ownership is where the money is. In, 20, in the 2022 budget, carried and participating interest in the oil industry gained us some 330 million US dollars, more than the corporate tax and royalties combined. This clearly shows that the 10% ownership that we currently have is able to get us more money than royalties and tax. It follows logically that more ownership will, of course, give us more money. How can we give all our resources to foreigners or foreign nationals or foreign-owned companies and turn around to say that there's no money using the same as pretext to tax our people to death? And let me add this quickly. Ghana currently stands as the number one producer of gold on the African continent, right? We've surpassed South Africa in production of gold in commercial quantities. But out of all of that, we only get some 1.71% of our revenue from the gold, I mean, the total gold revenue. This doesn't make sense. How is it that a national resource, which is supposed to go to the benefit of every single Ghanaian, we are only receiving 1.71% of the revenue from the gold sales? It's no different in the oil sector. We have oil in commercial quantities. And just after the 2016 period, we found two new fields. But out of our sale in oil, the whole nation is benefiting less than 10%, as we've seen here. So if the oil belongs to us, on what conditions, on what basis, and doesn't even make economic sense, do we give out all of this to foreign national companies while the entire nation is left to fend off of on just about 10% of this revenue? I mean, you'd agree with me that a proper review of our, of our mining laws and extractive industry would actually enjoy to the benefit of all of us, and then we can get to raise some of the revenue that we are so in that need of. Right. Production instead of taxation, and that'll be the sixth point. Taxation is one of the laziest measures to get money. And it's this reason for and it's for this reason that the huge appetite for taxes have been have been made rather than the focus on production. Now serious countries take holistic views of their economies to see the interconnectedness between the various productive sectors and how they can contribute to maximizing revenue. Without a robust and comprehensive social economic system, providing the people better living conditions, excessive taxation is a recipe for disaster. Indeed, the Vice President, His Excellency um, Dr. Baud Baumia, the Vice President said, or had mentioned, that excessive taxes prevent economic growth. And he has said, when there's no economic growth, there's no revenue. And when there's no revenue, you'll be forced to increase taxes. And in his very famous words, he says, we get trapped in a cyclical downward spiral, which means you cannot continue to depend on just taxation. You've got to shift the focus on taxation to production. But then we, we've not seen anything different. In fact, today we see more taxes than we even saw before he came into office. And, and, and that's something we have to really look on or look up to. Number seven, the neoliberal economic structure. The 2022 budget does not address the core issues of the structure of the economy. The over-reliance on the IMF and World Bank policy prescriptions that has led us to nowhere we are 
we are, we are in the first place is not going to take us anywhere. And to which, if they've not been able to take us anywhere in the last couple of years, there's no promise or there's no reason to believe that going for policy advice today is going to lead us anywhere. Year in, year out, they read budgets promising heaven and earth without any intention to fulfill them. They are much less concerned about changing the structure of the economy to benefit the masses rather than a few. This is what our fight is about, and we shall not stop. Again, this is what our fight is about, and we shall not stop. Until the total reconstruction of the country is achieved. Having analyzed the 2022 budget, we have come to the conclusion that the budget presents no hope for the people of Ghana, and rather, it is proposed, its proposed policies and measures will exacerbate the plight of the ordinary man and increase the hardship on us. We accordingly reject this budget. We reject the Momo tax, or whatever it's called, the e levy tax. We reject the bank transfer tax. We reject the increase in, ta in charges. In short, we reject the attempt to pile up hardship on the people and to deny them the right to the pursuit of happiness, freedom, and justice. We have together with the fellow co conveners co of the Fix the Country campaign scheduled a massive demonstration for the 26th of November 2021, which will be on Friday. It will be a massive demonstration to the Parliament House to tell the parliamentarians to their faces that we, the citizens of Ghana, on whose authority they sit there and take ex gratia, are instructing them to reject the 2022 budget. We call on all Ghanaians, particularly the youth, to show up for the demonstration as this affects each and every one of us. Thank you very much for coming.
Jerry Jarry would be at it. Other more mind, and he said, Oh, what's the last one with Jai Sadi Mediano? Nobody says he can't share or might be put to him. A bay, that is some of us was our own, and they are two men of us, some of us are not met here, and then they are not. They are also me as well. They are more what they are saying. I'm more funny or more move free. I'm an honor ever. Ever be a year, Juba was an hour, and they are over the head. You give up five years. You have been ten years in the answer. Why shall I say to your taxi? You trouble and discover bro my gana. If you say, say yet, yet you shim, yet you shim, who will remind you to be who say, Honor, secure Shahokra and also. A child taxes no more general. It is a common call and a common call just at ten years, fifteen years, five years. Now say, Gana, how will it be here? You are ten years, but so nobody change your ownership. Let us have the answer. I shall skip you. Because who is smarter, you are not smarter than them. Nesawunti, ye catch up with say on one stop us at the other side of the bay as a beba. No one dey abo on my no hobra. E kubi ebo. Sir, ye share on my ya. Ye we gudi eni a hobe ke ka hobe bre. Now so di a ye niya fi mi ye ki twelve. Nesawunti so what na se mi a mi ni a ya mi ti ni o me di a se. Sir mi a mi ni me dai na me dey ma haya. Me to me the dino ma hai, na me disikana che, na me ma fawansi. But me, on my own kuwa gan, on my own kuwa ni to me two gold waha. Yai sika yai yai ogo gold no mono. So gold ni two hundred cedis. Yai 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 one cedis seventy five pesos. Nya sabene u. Yai tina se jui mo yai tia se. Eti omo kuwa kuwa tina se no mo che sani omano. Eno disikana bre yai. I try se on my way he task ne he dia be dia be one one ni na. I'm not a banner, and no, no, you're in jail tomorrow. They are just to be a boy, say, on my own, you're best. I say, I'm king, say, yeah, yeah, me on my own, my own, dance, you're best. What I how did you know? Every year, which you move on as well. Say, yeah, she's a production. I say, it will be better for us to think about production. Yeah, give production more than say, yeah, get taxes. So we produce more, you get more. Uh, sometimes they yeah, are, I didn't know where simple logic. Now, I mean, say, yeah, politicians are part. They are real things are simple logic, so they, I don't understand. But someone's not saying, that's a move who is there. Say, you're you producing your mom more. You make a cigar. I didn't know you're producing the idea of talk. I didn't know you're making a cigar. It's you're producing more. Now, you're just saying, or how are you at it now? You're doing this one on my program. Ghana. There are a chat one. Make a one seven. Hmm. So same way. The young bear one now one friend and the baby. But make one a tougher. It will be better say you pay for. I'm not betting on it. Let you make the end now soon. My idea of what's now parliament. I'm not betting no. Because a young man is casa. I'm not betting for. They are representing us. Sir, your casa, your pay, your pay, your pay, not your pay. It is on my own casa side. The young pay, not your pay. It will be better, sir. If we need four bedrooms, no one will say. And the money or who to know? It is not helping Ghanaians. And what on my own? And what in my own? Now, sir, my own pay job or who are? You know, you know. Every year, we are obeying the Biya Koso. We are casting budo and she. Now we are budo and she is here. We are building a new. We are damasi the building. Thank you very much to our national spokespersons. So from here, I'm going to invite an Apple rep. You have an Apple rep here. Okay, when I go. Q and A. Any questions? So, okay. Before that, uh, we want to take questions and answers before we go to any of our co-convenors to come speak here on the table. Questions? Any questions? Any questions, though? Right, let me run through this. Um, so we we earlier mentioned that um, the auditor general report for the year 2019-2020. 
has said that um, 12 billion Ghana cities has been lost to corruption. And I don't like to use the word corruption because it doesn't really address the issues properly. It's stealing, it's theft. So 12 billion Ghana cities has been stolen. Now, they, they claim they want to raise some 6.9 billion Ghana cities, and that's why they're charging us the e-tax, right? Now, 6.9 billion is just about half of what is being stolen. So if they were really serious about raising this revenue, if you could stop the theft of public monies, which is up to the tune of 12 billion Ghana cities, you would have more than twice what you need to take care of some of these projects you're looking for the funding for, and Ghanaians would have been spared the burdens of the e-levy or the electronic levy that they, they are pushing on us. Uh, so I just wanted to push that out there for the record, that looking for 6.9 billion will make sense to cut off the wastage that is going to, that's going out through theft of 12 billion Ghana cities, and that could take care of this and other projects. All right, thank you. Um, any other questions? Uh huh. And see, the me bread, the other bread, no work any now. And say, say you pay six point a here a here billion. Now the amount for here twelve point a here a here billion. And the other thing is, I say, you pay this a chrono net da hono. Every ho, now the asikano. It's me a beshe. Sir, six point a here a here billion. Now you just know. I'm saying the best one if you go mine or so. But that's it. I said this up. So my name is Kaba. Kaba, how do you come forward? My name is Kaba. So um you said that both the NDC and the MPP have been here for a while and they've been doing a lot of stuff that doesn't develop the country. What do we do to them? What alternative do we have? Awesome. Awesome. Right. Um, if, if there are other questions, we can take all of them and respond to them. Yeah. Any other question? So we save time. Yeah, yeah. Questions, and answers, questions and answers section. So. Questions? Am I allowed to ask myself a question and answer? Yeah. <laughs> Is it allowed? Yeah. OK, all right. So then um, someone asked. Um, we spoke about production instead of taxation. How do we go about that? So I'll, I'll chip that in with my brother's question and I'll answer. But if there are any more questions? Oh, I wish I. Okay, all right. So um, let me. One question. Okay. that we are trying to build um, a consensus, a certain critical mass number. And with that number, we'll be able to take on the power structure that's competing in elections. And we're not looking at just competing for the fact of competing, no. We are looking at capturing political power so we can do or reconstruct Ghana the way it's supposed to be. But we cannot do this if we do not have that critical mass number. And that's why we try to raise um, a million votes. And by that, getting a million signatures to, to push that campaign for a new constitution. Indeed, we're not cutting it off at a million people. We're looking at expanding that number to more than three million. And if we have a seed number or a root number of 3.5 million Ghanaians, then we become a very, very solid force and we can take on the power structure. So um, that is not lost on us. But I mean, you have to, you can't put the cart before the horse. 
So in our organization of organization right now, we're looking at building the organization to, to have that number, that critical mass, and then we can take on the next the next phase of the action. Um, to touch on, well, I'll take I'll take my second question before I go to the one I said. So that will be on um, my brother's the price of democracy, and and that's that's a very brilliant observation. But um, democracy is actually supposed to be government for the people, by the people, and for the people, right? What we practice is actually an aspect of democracy and not democracy in totality. How do I mean? Apart from the periodic elections that we do, we practice, we go to the polls every four years on one day. What other democratic principles do we practice? Rule of law. There are certain people in this country, and I'm going into the Auditor General's report, who have been clearly mentioned and identified by the Auditor General, but no prosecutions have happened up to today. What happened to equality before the law? We have ordinary Ghanaians who have stolen five seeds, a bunch of plantains, kontumri, and are serving time in Sawam. But why have these people who have been mentioned and named by the Auditor General have not been brought to book? Where, what happens to the, uh, the rule of law? Are some people more Ghanaian than some other people? That definitely cannot be democracy. Then again, you look at um, the, the representation of the people. Now, we erroneously refer to those people as government. They are not. It is you and I and everybody who is Ghanaian. We are the government. Those people in those places are our elected representatives. So they're supposed to represent the people of Ghana. Now, indeed, if they're going to make any decisions in parliament, no member of parliament has any authority to make any decisions there unless they have the consent of the people of Ghana. But when, la when last were you consulted for your ideas or your opinions on any idea or any policy that was voted or passed on in, in parliament? None. So it's a sham democracy that we're practicing. And democracy is not to spoil a few people at the expense of the masses. No. We make collective sacrifices for the collective good. So indeed, if you and I are being called upon in very, very hard times to make certain sacrifices, to put our monies together, to push certain developmental agendas, why are some people being exempted from that sacrifice? So all the, the benefits and the luxuries that they're enjoying, why can't they make the same sacrifices that all of us are supposed to make to make sure that this nation is built? So clearly, this points out to the fact that we're not practicing a democracy. It's a sham democracy, a scam of a democracy. It's, it's, it's a... It's what we like to call a legal fiction. They, they try to create an illusion of democracy, but we're not practicing a democracy. Uh, um, is there anything you'd like me to address? But I hope, I hope your point is not taken. Nice, all right. So now we come back to um, the question I said and I want to answer. That uh, how then do we pro pro uh, promote production? How do we drive production? And I'd like to touch on four major issues. And I'm particularly interested in this, in this question because uh, most of our campaign in the Fix the Country movement, we come across this, this issue. People ask, okay, so if we are asking for the country to be fixed, what exactly are we looking to be fixed? Or then we should limit our points of request to certain items so that we can address that. But I've consistently said that our problems are interconnected. So we cannot give you a list of, say, four or five items and say we want these issues fixed. No. Like I said, all these individual issues are interconnected. How do I mean? To drive industrialization, you first need to look at your power generation capacity. And this is the field of energy. Now with this, Ghana has currently, we have a very high generation capacity, even more than what we are consuming. But the problem is that most of these plants are run on light crude oil, which is relatively expensive. So then it will mean that the cost of production for energy in particular will be very high, which will not be good for business. And that's why we're not we're still experiencing power challenges. So for any serious government that is looking at promoting industrialization, your first major concern would be to consolidate your energy generation capacity by investing in renewable, sustainable energy resources or sources. And you'll be looking at technologies like waste of energy and all of that. Indeed, barely two weeks ago, we had a, a team of over 300 people representing Ghana in Glasgow for the COP26, right? And it was on moving away from the dependence on fossil fuels as we have in right now because of global warming and all of that. So indeed, the whole world is geared towards finding alternative, renewable, sustainable energy sources and moving away from fossil fuels. And that should be the main prerequisite or the primary concern of any government that is serious about industrialization. But we are not seeing that being addressed in even this budget here. So then it's difficult to believe that the government is indeed committed to production rather than taxation. The second issue here would be with education. 
Now, to promote industrialization, you've got to have skilled labor, all right? So you have to have a skilled labor force, and that has to do with your issue of education. But if you look at the educational system as it stands today, there's no particular interest or focus on, 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 um, on the skills that will prepare the youth or the labor force for industrialization. It is not. We run what I like to refer to as an, as an administrative economy, where rather than focus on production, we're looking at administrative duties. So everybody sits behind a computer in their office in the air-conditioned rooms, and they just key feeders into the computer without any production taking place. So then it affects drastically uh, internal generation capacity for revenue. So any serious government will look at your educational se sector, and your educational sector will be promoting the, the study of, of, um, of, of technology, you know, um, engineering, that would actually bring out skilled labor that would drive the industrialization industrialization process. But that is also have been left out. Now, you cannot address the energy sector without the skilled labor sector. So all of these are interconnected. The next thing would be infrastructure. I have said time and time again that roads are not built for the comfort of the citizens. We don't build roads so you can ride around comfortably. That is not the primary objective of roads. Roads are a conduit of productivity. In that, roads are supposed to connect the market centers to your industrial sectors, right? Or your, your sources of production for raw materials to your industries. So roads are supposed to be a connection, a medium of productivity. And I'll give a typical example with the cocoa roads. Cocoa roads are supposed to connect cocoa growing communities with the market centers, all right? So in the very short possible time, you find out that the roads pay for themselves. They pay themselves off. So cocoa roads generate enough revenue, so much so that we are able to commit those revenues to other developmental projects out elsewhere. And this is the primary focus or, or objective of building roads. So then if you have someone touting that we are building roads or building roads, your next question is how are we going to pay for these roads? And what is the purpose of that roads? Are they connecting the market centers again to the industries or to the market, I mean from the production sources to the market centers? If the answer is no, then you know that we're going to be dependent on exorbitant taxes or from borrowing to, to find roads. But infrastructure is supposed to be a key component of the industrialization drive, as I've already elaborated. The next thing you're going to look at is your healthcare service. You cannot have productive workers, efficient workers, if you're not healthy workers, right? And the healthcare system is not just with the, um, with the treatment se sector or the creative sector, no, but you're looking at preventive sector. And healthier will be with your food too. So you're not looking at just your medicines that you're taking or your doctor looking at you, no. Your health is directly tied into what you consume, your food. So then again, you cannot even start considering your health sector without looking at the agricultural sector. Then again, just with this, these four um, components I've mentioned, you realize that they are interconnected and you cannot deal with one without the other. So then again, if someone asks us what is our mission, I mean, what are our grievances, what issues do we want the government to address, we say we cannot mention single items and leave them in isolation, no. You have to have a holistic national approach to our issues, and that's where you can find lasting, sustainable solutions. All right, thank you very much. Um, any more questions? Joe, I wish you have more on a tougher. May what your kind of tougher? Yeah, more fun, Chairman. May fun today are more than my brother, and they be cheap. It is a fun thing to do more than the Chairman, but I'll celebrate. Um, the attorney said, Now you share a quiet in the first one. Now you have production, production. You have to do my union be human. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I want to go and your man, nine so I have been to me a first one. You bet me at the other end. And then you know, as a way here for when could you win? Uh huh. I said, See, I'm used to it. So no, but I go and could you have a go and you know, the attorney said. Uh, the first thing I would say is, or no, I didn't check it. No, say you present your your production. The first thing I was say is, energy. 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 Uh-huh. 
My name is Anita from the Times. Times. Uh, during your presentation, you mentioned that on 26th of November, there'll be a session. I would like to find out whether the police sorted out issue with the police because there have been a series of issues on this demonstration. I wanted right. to come right. um, Thank you very much for that. And, uh, uh, I'd like to, to clarify some issues quickly uh, concerning our relation with the police. Now, the Public Order Act demands that we notify the police. We do not seek permission from the police. And that is something that has been, has been misunderstood for a very long time. So people think we would have to go and seek permission from the police before we can embark on demonstrations. No. It's a constitutionally protected right. In that, the, the Constitution enshrines that act that is a, is a right of every Ghanaian to peacefully demonstrate. So we only notify the police and we tell them, oh, this is what we intend to do. The police has no power to decide or to reject that, that notification. They cannot say they are not allowing us to go on a demonstration. And indeed, before the Fix the Country demonstration came on on the, uh, on the 4th of August, prior to that, we, have, we had a long battle with the police in court. And we are going to the High Court and even all the way to the Supreme Court. And both courts, including the Supreme Court, had held that indeed it was our right to demonstrate and we only needed to inform or notify the police. In fact, prior to all of this, in I think 1994 or 95, the MVP versus the IGP had a similar issue that was debated in the Supreme Court. And the ruling was that the police only needed to be notified and that they had no power to decide or reject the people's demands to go for a peaceful demonstration. That being said, because we are a law-abiding organization, and citizens for that matter, we have decided to engage the police. So concurrently, as we're having this press conference, a few of our colleagues are in a meeting with the police um, head, um, leaders or leadership at the police headquarters, trying to iron out some large issues with the intended demonstration. But for, for all intents and purposes, it's still coming off. It's definitely coming off on the 26th of November. That will be on Friday. And as time goes on, we'll just um, communicate the fine details of, of what it's going to be like. But that demonstration is actually to, to register our displeasure and to demand that they drop that 2022 budget. Yes. Oh, yes, and the hashtag that's running is hashtag drop that budget. If, if you can recollect, I think in 2019, uh, what was it? Yeah. The, 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 the chamber, yes. So we, we launched another campaign in 2019 that was hashtag drop that chamber. And this was at a time when our, our members of parliament were proposing for a new um, parliamentary chamber to be built. That was going to cost some $200 million. And we kicked against it with the hashtag drop that chamber. And we think if this same uh, um, um, discriminatory, insensitive budget is going to be coming from the same quarters, 
It's only rights that we, we release the hashtag drop that budget. Remind them. Yes, we remind them that they should drop this budget too as well. So that will be coming up on the 26th of November 2021. Right. Okay. Uh, on T3. Uh, on T3. Oh, maybe T3, but I said I have a Oh, the answer. I said T3. That's wrong. On T3. Okay, Etty. Yeah, yeah, can you now say? Yeah, I'm going to be out If you have that, Ebay. Uh, 26th. Yeah, 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 bro, baby. Ghana for be any. Yeah, ma, obi at ya si eh. Adi anu, eh, 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 conference, eh, 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 press conference, yeah, 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 no. Yeah, movie. Now, movie, now, yeah, movie, yeah, movie, free, baby, yeah, yeah, free, home, um, uh, uh, thermal station. Yeah, then, 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 one, there, there, could be a parliament house. Look. No, we are not joking. I said they are 2019. Don't that change my buy and I brought you away as to no one in the Union and Jerono. Or no one or Tias here, a goofy bugger. They are two or no one in him. At the end of the day, the chairman is a drop in. Budget is a better drop. And that is an assurance you are giving Ghanaians because here, Ghana for black people are not seeing it because of Muku or no more. Ghana for blue. So what nanti is sane for me when I want to near myself because obi te hono mo no oji na kwa ho be ye one week as we get one million na dey at the phone so I just need to say hey how many is sorry na me kasa kroda dem kroda dem na me kasa o kroda dem o a hundred dollar city be one week as we get at the phone so e dey continue you see no tonic na me ka je so me be tie so asika we man ka wa dey but me no wey but you are here, so to a banner. So on the 26th, you can hear a movie from Thema Station. You are not here, you are here, you are here, you are And I am encouraging the youth to be catching it. You are here, you are here, you are here, you are here, because you are here, 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 on the 26th, which is Friday, you have a OPN demonstration. You are handling police, don't worry, in the uniform. If you have a crowd, you will be able to get a They said they are a mini car. Police is going to be able to get a car. They are going to get a car. They are going to get a car. They are going to get a car. Sir, I will be passing on my yard and fire on your yard. Boom, man! But I know you say you you do not sell in the air. Sir, so one case I will submit to one of them. No, my baby. Uh huh. Bank bounty. And yes, you should say you will be very heavy. And when I say yes, sir, I can't do what you say. No, no, you didn't say you will be very heavy. Eh? If you better talk with them, they say they are very very much more tired. No, if you better talk, and we are ready for it. With the, with the, with our demonstrations that we've been embarking on, we always say they are peaceful demonstrations, right? And in all of that, you realize that we don't go to the demonstration grounds with any weapons or any objects that would, that, that would be potentially described as weapons or, or harmful objects. We always go with that clear mindset that we want to just register our displeasure. But if you look at the posturing of the police, they always turn up armed to the teeth. And the excuse they give is that they want to protect us. And we ask, protect us from who? If you're protecting us from the masses of the people, we are standing and speaking for the masses of the people. So why do we even need protection from the people? We are the people, we are with them. So we don't need protection from ourselves. So then again, I, I do not understand why there will be armed policemen sent to, to give protection to peaceful protesters. I mean, what, what do we need protection from? And, and what we, if we, indeed we even need protection from something, is that thing so, so deadly or so dangerous that they have to come armed to the teeth, finger on the trigger? I mean, so where from that posture? So I have already, very undemocratic, and we've said this consistently that we have to review our laws concerning demonstrations and all of these. If the police are coming, I understand and I appreciate where they say 
Um, there might be escalations where tensions might rise, and you know, there might be some routing and all of that, yes. But this does not demand such ammunition or, or weapons. I mean, we have right control. And indeed, if we go back to the democracy we're talking about, if we're going to learn from advanced democracies, they never send their police, police forces that are trained on how to handle mass mass movements like that or, or routes in, in that instance. And they do not show up with, with guns and, and all of this. I'm just putting this out there because we do not want a situation where a recurrence of what happened in Nigeria would, would repeat itself. We do not want that. Where armed policemen and military men will be sent with light ammunition against peaceful demonstrators. We do not want that. In, in, another, in another breath, I'd like to send this out to the, the people. You're supposed to employ that professional skill of de-escalation. And de-escalation just means releasing tension, bringing that heated uh, um, atmosphere down to a barrier's minimum where sanity and reasoning can prevail and not resorting to brutal force. So this would be an appeal to the police service to consider retraining our pol police personnel on de-escalation techniques and not to be just, I mean, not for the first resort to be the using of brute force. That's, that is not what we need in a budget fledged democracy as ours. Thank you. And just to add to what our national spokesperson said, we, know, we realize that FTC and Takade, that uh, the police is more conscious when we are streaming the whole protest of Facebook Live. So we want to assure the police that what, whenever we step on the street, from A to Z, will be streamed on Facebook Live. Whatever happens, whatever they decide to do, the whole world is going to see. So um, since uh, none of our co conveners are here, we want to just add, I want to add that the women, we can also step out there. Do not be scared. Do not be scared because you also matter. You are a woman. You need it because even if probably your husband can make it, you can stand up for yourself and your children. Step, stand out there. You see, God, I don't that even branded somewhere as if we don't even know how to fend for ourselves. We can't make money for ourselves. All of this is part of it. Step out there and talk for yourself. So please come in your huge numbers on the 6th of November to and join us mass to the parliament. That says you don't have anything else to say. Thank you very much. Uh, this is another lunch. Another lunch. In fact, we have two lunches. Three, actually. The 26th is a powerful demonstration. On the 10th, it's another powerful demonstration in the Boise. A very powerful demonstration. We are fixing the whole country. And we are moving to Obwase to go and fix Obwase on the 3rd of December. On the 3rd of December, we are fixing Obwase. A week later, which is the 10th of December, we are fixing in Zima. We are fixing in Zima. So, we, we just want everybody to understand that on the 26th is a demonstration to drop that budget. Yeah, but somebody has here. Oh, okay. Uh, that just said, I have four. But I'm in real way. 26th November, I have dropped that budget. Powerful. You need a You need a No. On the 10th of December, I fix a boise. Ghana, you go to power and you go to the Cassiabra and you fix it. On the 10th of December, you have fixed it in the man. Baby, you have gas in your own car. You have oil in your own car. You have fixed it. On the 27th of December, you have fixed the Christmas in your own car. You have fixed After Boxing Day, you have fixed it. Cape Coast. Baby, you have fixed it. You have fixed it. You have fixed it. And you have fixed it. And you no, this year is a year of fixing. And we are going to fix. Whether they like it or not, we are fixing. So I'm going to I'm going to You are fixing. You are dancing. We are fucking tired. The energy is contagious, so get yourself attached to it. So thank you very much for being here today. And then please put the messages out as you head it. Thank you.